France of the Rouge is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. We have been training residents to survey for frogs and toads and for bugs since 1998. The Rouge River Watershed Frog and Toad Survey is simple, fun, and does not require special skills or previous knowledge. The goals of the survey are to collect data about the health of the watershed and raise public awareness about the importance of animal species diversity and the value of wetlands. Participating in this survey will change your life. Never again will you not know what those strange peeps and twangs are that you hear in the spring. You'll join the growing core of citizen scientists that contribute their time to better understand nature and how we can nurture it. We live in the greatest freshwater system in the world with 20% of the world's freshwater contained within our very own Great Lakes. Lake Superior is the largest unfrozen body of freshwater in the world. In this infrared photograph, you can easily locate our area. Do you live in a watershed? A watershed is all the land that is drained by a body of water. When it rains or when you water your lawn, some of that water drains off. Even if you don't live close to a river or lake, the storm drains on your street drains somewhere. Wherever you live on earth, you are part of some watershed. In Metro Detroit, there are three major watersheds. The Clinton, the green area on this map, the Huron, the orange area, and the Rouge in yellow. River organizations focus on the whole watershed, not just the river, because the way we treat the land has a huge impact on water quality. The Rouge River watershed drains 467 square miles of land, has 125 miles of major stream, and flows through 48 communities, three counties, Oakland, Wayne, and Washtenaw, and is home to 1.35 million residents. There are four major branches, the main, upper, middle, and lower. Many people think that industry is responsible for most of the Rouge River's problems. In reality, 70 to 80% of water pollution in the United States comes from non-point source pollution, mainly stormwater runoff and all the pollutants it carries. Wetlands can retain and filter up to 72% of the runoff from a small storm, but they do not have this function when they are drained and filled. The Rouge River has vastly improved since its low point in 1969 when the surface of the river ran so thick with oil it caught on fire. The work of thousands of volunteers and cleanup projects supported by federal, state, and local dollars have greatly improved water quality and wildlife is returning. Wetlands are critical to the river's recovery. This map shows all the wetlands in the Rouge River watershed, mapped by Friends of the Rouge staff and interns in 2005. Wetlands are critical to the health of the watershed as they act like kidneys, filtering pollutants, absorbing runoff, and protecting us from flooding. They are also extremely important wildlife areas. Wetlands are one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, comparable to rainforests and coral reefs. While only 5% of the land surface in the United States is wetland, Wetlands contain 31% of all plant species, support 43% of all federal listed threatened and endangered species, 190 amphibian species, and one third of all bird species. A wetland is defined by hydrology, i.e. water, plants, soils, and wildlife. In this photo, you can tell this is a wetland due to the standing water, the cattails or marsh, and the egret. There are many different types of wetlands, vernal pond, wet meadow, marsh, wooded swamp, and pond. What type of wetland is pictured here? You said pond and marsh, you are correct. This photo shows a mosaic of wetlands, including marsh, scrub shrub, and forested in the back. Each frog or toad species prefers different types of wetlands. Therefore, an area with several types will support more calling frogs and toads. Is this a wetland? Yes, this is a wet meadow, the preferred habitat of the most common species in the Rouge River watershed, the American toad. You can see a slight change in the vegetation to the left of the shrub where sedges dominate. According to a 2014 study, Michigan has lost 61% of its original wetlands. Oakland County has lost 55%, Washtenaw 53%, and Wayne 90%. Michigan develops its land eight times faster than the population grows. The U.S. average is 2.5, and wetlands are often the victim. There are some protections for wetlands through the Clean Water Act requiring developers to apply for a permit to drain or fill a wetland and compensate for it. This has helped to retain existing wetlands, but recently many of these regulations are being relaxed and smaller wetlands are never protected. Impervious or paved surfaces contribute to problems in the Rouge River. 
This map depicts the percent of paved surfaces with the dark blue being 77 to 100% paved and the lighter yellow areas up to 36%. The Center for Watershed Protection found that biodiversity declines once a watershed is more than 10% impervious. When natural areas are paved over, they lose the ability to absorb and filter stormwater. Stormwater runoff causes the river to rise and fall rapidly, resulting in a flashy river with eroded banks and sediment in the water, making it difficult for fish and other gill-breathing creatures to survive. Pollutants like motor oil, pet waste, fertilizer, etc. that wash in increase the problem. Landowners like you can reduce the negative effects of stormwater runoff by disconnecting your downspouts, installing rain gardens and rain barrels, reducing paved surfaces, or even using pervious pavers. Replacing lawn with deep-rooted native vegetation also helps slow runoff and provides better homes for wildlife. On to the frogs. In 1998, Friends of the Rouge decided to train residents to survey wetlands by listening for calling frogs and toads. These animals rely on good quality wetlands and upland habitat to live, so their presence or absence is a very good indication of wetland health. Their characteristic of calling in the spring makes it very easy to survey for them by simply listening for their calls. There are eight calls that you're gonna to need to learn for this survey, and it's best to start with the early calling species because those are the only ones that you're gonna hear when you first start doing your surveys. Most of the early calling species prefer to use vernal ponds or spring ponds, ponds that hold water in spring, but sometimes dry up in late summer. Vernal ponds are critical for the smaller frogs and toad species because of the absence of fish. Wood frogs are the first frog to call in the spring. They are recognized by a black mask behind the eye. Male wood frogs are blue and females are red. Wood frogs are obligate users of vernal ponds and need adjacent wooded areas. They spend the winter in old logs or leaf piles and can survive freezing. Unlike the other frogs and toads, wood frogs are explosive breeders and do all of their calling and breeding in a week or two. This is why you must survey more often in the early spring. Their call sounds like ducks quacking, chickens clucking, or turkeys gobbling. We'll see what you think. shows our survey results compiled for all the years of the survey. The green boxes are where the wood frogs were heard. The white boxes are where they were surveyed but not heard. They are likely undercounted due to their short breeding window. Midland chorus frogs, formerly known as western chorus frogs, are Michigan's second smallest species and start calling very early in the spring. They are tiny and they have stripes if you ever do see them. They use vernal ponds with sunny open areas. Their calls sound like running your fingers over the tines of a car. Unlike most frogs, they do call during the day, especially in the early spring. Midland chorus frogs are heard in a little less than half of all surveyed blocks. Michigan's smallest frog is the spring peeper, and it's also the loudest. Spring peepers do not get much larger than an adult's thumbnail. They have a cross on their back, thus the Latin name crucifer. They use vernal ponds with more vegetation than the chorus frogs, though they are often found in the same location. They start calling in late March to early April, April with a call like a jingle bell or saying their name, peep, peep, peep. Spring peepers are not quite as common in the rouge as chorus frogs and may be declining. The American toad is the most common frog or toad heard in the Rouge River watershed. Toads have dry, bumpy skin and shorter legs than the fast jumping frogs. They therefore prefer wetlands without heavy vegetation and will use ditches and backyard ponds for breeding. They're not very particular. Their call is a trill. They start calling in early April with April 15th being maximum calling time for them. American toads are heard in 60% of all survey blocks, making them the most commonly heard species in the watershed. This photo shows what it's all about for the frogs and toads they're calling. 
Only male frogs and toads call, and the call is to attract mates. In early spring, males reach the wetlands first, and the largest, healthiest ones find the best spots in the pond to call. This photo shows Amplexus with a smaller male on top, fertilizing the eggs the female is laying. You can see the black strings. Toads lay their eggs in strings, while frogs lay them in clumps. Most of the later calling frogs are found in permanent ponds as it takes two seasons before their tadpoles transform. The northern leopard frog is the most sensitive species in the watershed. They have spots like a leopard, thus the name. Their preferred habitat is the sunny edges of lakes, but they also use vernal and permanent ponds. They start calling in April and their call is a snore. Leopard frogs were once very common in the British River watershed, but are now quite rare, only heard in 9% of survey books. What's this? It's a gray frog on a tree. Hmm, must be a gray tree frog. Gray tree frogs are a bit of a misnomer in that these are one of the frogs that can actually change color depending on their envi environment and can be bright green or gray. They're medium-sized frogs that use permanent ponds and forested areas. They start calling in May, often from as high as 10 feet high in the trees. Their call is a burst of a trill. Great tree frogs are fairly common, though they are not found in the more urbanized areas. Green frogs are the second largest frog and spend most of their life in a pond or lake. Green frogs can be distinguished from the bullfrog by the dorsolateral line or fold of skin that goes from behind the eye to the back that bullfrogs lack. Both bullfrogs and green frogs can be sexed by the size of the eardrum. In males, the eardrum, or tympanium, is larger than the eye. Green frogs do not start calling until the temperature is consistently 60 degrees. They are found in permanent ponds. Their call is a twang or a banjo string pluck. Green frogs are fairly common, found in 39% of survey blocks and increasing over the past few years. They're known to be fairly insensitive, uh, able to fall into heavily chlorinated swimming pools and still survive. The bullfrog is the largest frog species in Michigan. They lack the fold of skin along the back of the green frog. They require deep, permanent ponds with a lot of vegetation. They are the last species to start calling, and their call sounds like rum, rum, rum. <coughs> Bullfrogs need a large predator base and are not common. Sure. They also will eat other frogs, tadpoles, and eggs. This map is a compilation of all of our survey results from 1998. The blue box have the most species, while the yellow have only one to two. The headwaters of the Rouge have the highest diversity of frogs and toads, while the urban areas only support a few species. There are some pockets of good habitat in the more urban areas. Detailed instructions for this survey are found in the participant's guide. Study this guide, then use it to learn the eight breeding calls using the Frog Call CD from SoundCloud or the app Froggy Voice. To choose a survey block, check the survey map and find a block near you that has wetlands that you are interested in. Contact Sally Petrella to sign up for a block. This survey is made possible by the Michigan Association of Environmental Professionals, Waste Management, the Herb Family Foundation, and Bosch, as well as volunteer donations and memberships. Become a member of Friends of the Rouge today to support this work and ensure that we can continue training surveyors like this and collect this valuable data. Thank you for participating.